All right, I wanted to welcome everybody to the Clean Tech Nation Briefing Series webinar based on our latest report, Getting to 100. My name is Bryce Yonker. I'm Clean Edge Director of Business Development. We have almost 250 folks registered for today's webinar, spanning investors, corporates, state and city governments, and many others. Just a quick housekeeping note, everybody on the call is in listen-only mode, which means uh, to participate, you'll need to interact with the GoToMeeting webinar platform. Imagine you have done that in the past. Go into the question field in the chat box, type in your questions, and we'd love to hear from you during the session. I'd like to hand it over now to Clean Edge's Managing Director, Ron Pernick. He's going to be managing today's session. Over to you, Ron. Thanks, Bryce, and, and welcome everyone to today's webinar on Getting to 100, Governments Leading the Charge. The goal of powering nations, states, and cities with 50%, 75%, even 100% renewable electricity would have seemed preposterous not long ago. But increasingly, a growing number of governments are aiming to achieve such targets, with some already reaching these goals. According to our latest report, Getting to 100, commissioned by our partner, SolarCity. Uh, if you're interested in seeing the report, if you haven't already, you can get that off the Clean Edge website. And I want to remind everyone today, we are live tweeting this event on Twitter with the hashtag getting to 100. Um, with me today, to really help us understand what's driving uh, this increasing number of governments to target clean energy deployment at pretty significant rates, are David Hochschild, Commissioner of California Energy Commission, Scott Johnstone, Executive Director, of Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, David Sandbank, Director, New York Sun at NYSERDA, and Eric Fogelberg, SVP, Commercial Sales and Storage Solutions at Solar City. It's an honor to have all of you on the webinar today, so many thanks for joining us. Um, just a reminder to everyone, uh, today's webinar is formatted to encourage an interactive dialogue. Um, in addition to my moderating the conversation, we want to get to as many questions from attendees as possible. Uh, so we, we encourage you to type your questions into the chat box at any time. Bryce will be curating those and sending them over to me, and we'll get to as many of your questions as possible uh, over the last 15 minutes or so of the webinar. Um, before we begin, uh, I want to quickly highlight a few tables and charts and key findings from our Getting to 100 report. Um, we see five major developments enabling the shift to increasingly ambitious RE deployment among both corporations and governments. Uh, first, uh, distributed solar has become cost effective across a growing list of geographies. Just 10 years ago, the cost to install a solar PV system was around 30 to 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Today, and this is just for some large-scale systems, we see uh, pricing with deals even below the $0.04 cents a kilowatt hour rate. Uh, that's not for all systems, but it gives you an idea of the significant cost reductions that we've seen. Um, some large-scale systems uh, in the utility-scale renewables area have really uh, expanded rapidly as well. Uh, in the U.S., as, as many of you probably know, utility-scale wind and solar accounted for approximately 60% of all new capacity additions uh, in the first three quarters of 2015. I think the number will hold pretty steady for the full year when those numbers come out. Um, when it comes to capacity additions in the U.S., coal is no longer a player, and it's become the domain of solar, wind, and natural gas. Next, energy storage is becoming increasingly cost competitive. We'll talk about that a lot, I believe, today, and is poised as costs come down further to become a central piece of the renewable energy arsenal and to complete the puzzle. Similarly, net zero buildings and smart devices are driving an energy efficiency renaissance. As most industry trackers know, a watt saved is cheaper than a watt generated in almost all instances and a core component to any mass renewables initiative. And finally, an emboldened, resilient, and two-way grid is taking shape. As Clean Edge will cover in a new report and index that we'll be issuing next week with the GridWise Alliance, grid modernization is, the heart, is at the heart of many states' initiatives to deploy a secure and cleaner electricity system. 
Um, as highlighted in this table, uh, also from our recent report, some governments have already reached the 100% goal. In the U.S., Greensburg, Kansas was one of the first cities to reach such a target. It's a small city, but it rebuilt itself after a devastating tornado disaster, and it now runs on 100% renewables. Recently, Aspen, Colorado joined this distinctive club, and of course, places like Iceland and parts of Germany and New Zealand, among others, as shown in this table. But to date, we've mostly seen activity from smaller cities and regions. So what's to come? A growing number of governments around the world, many significant in size, and some of them on this call today, are now committing to getting to 50, 75, even 100% renewable electricity. In the U.S., this includes California's 50% RPS by 2030, and Vermont's 75% 75, 75 RPS by 2032. And since the publication of our report just a month ago, San Diego joined the ranks of other large American cities targeting 100% along with cities like San Francisco that are listed on the table. I'd now like to move on to questions with our panelists. We have an amazing group of people here today, uh, and hopefully we can unpack what's driving and enabling this shift across geographies. And we have a lot of cities and states and other reps on the call, so hopefully uh, you'll all be able to learn a bit from, from our panelists. So, David, uh, I want to start with you, um, Hope Shield. Uh, on multiple fronts, California has been leading the charge in the transition to a clean energy economy. The state's 50% RPS by 2030, the energy storage mandate, and of course the carbon market are just a few of the leadership roles taken by the state. And, and not surprisingly, California has taken the top spot in our state leadership index six years running. Can you share with our audience what's driving all this activity? Uh, it's been happening under two different governors and what the market will look like over the next decade as California transitions to ever-increasing renewables adoption. So, David, over to sure. you. Sure. Well, well, first, uh, thank you for hosting this, and, and thanks also to my fellow panelists from New York and Vermont. I, I just want to say, you know, you don't have to be a big state to make a big difference, and really most of the action that's driving the progress we have seen in the United States is made at the state level because we don't have meaningful renewable legislation other than the uh, Clean Power Plan, which is being done administratively, um, happening through Congress. So the states are really driving this, and collectively, you know, all of us pushing, uh, I think, is what's going to make the difference. In California, really what's driving is, I think, the people of our state um, of the natural world, and like clean air and clean water, and this has been a consistent priority, so that even um, when the, you know, the party holding the governor's office changes, um, that... Uh, push for the environment continues. And we now know very clearly what works, um, which is long-term stable policies that create conditions for investment to incur and for a, a, a ramp up to happen. And you get away from what we used to do, which is this sort of stop-start policy cycle. And the results have been tremendous. As you mentioned, Ron, you know, um, in 2000, solar cost 50 cents a kilowatt hour, now below um, in some places below four cents. Uh, there's more, more solar employees in the state of California than there are uh, people who work for all of our utilities combined. And so I think the vision going forward is for, in the same way that uh, tech has really driven the California economy uh, in the last decade, you know, with Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Uber, and so many other companies that have, have gone global. I mean, Going forward, I think the same vision for clean energy, and you see companies like Solar City and Tesla and others um, really uh, expanding at a, at a rapid clip, and that's what we want to encourage. And there's a real commitment to this vision, and, and this was just uh, finally cemented with this 50% renewable energy goal by 2030, uh, which is now uh, the course that we're on. And, uh, you know, that is uh, not the end point. That's the starting point. We're going to go well beyond that. Um, and, but and just to yeah. put it in perspective, David, real quick, can you give us an idea where where California was just about 10 years ago and where you are today yeah, in so terms just, of reaching you know, those goals? Even, even more rapidly than that. So you go back to 2008, and we were 12% renewables in the state of California, 12%. Today, we're at 25%. We are fully contracted to get to 33% renewables by 2020, uh, and then to 50% um by by uh, by 2030, and you know the nice thing about this next step we're taking is that because the price of renewables is so low, 
um, this is actually exactly the right time to scale up. And so uh, when we're talking about these utility scale, some of these utility scale renewable projects, they are cheaper than new coal and in many cases yeah. new gas. So uh, things have changed. Yeah, and I think uh, California, the first state to uh, hit the past the 5% threshold for solar. Um, let, let's go on now to the other, David. Um, and um, David, when I, when I look at states leading the charge on reinventing their energy sectors, I immediately think of both California and New York. Uh, New York's REV initiative is changing the way electrons are generated, saved, and distributed within the Empire State. C can you tell our audience a bit more about how REV and more specifically the state's New York Sun initiative, which you oversee, are impacting solar deployment in, in New York? So over to you, David. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, REV is, is all about, it's, it stands for reforming the energy vision, and it's a Governor Cuomo's uh, initiative to change the way to a strategy to build a clean and resilient and affordable energy system for for basically all New York all New Yorkers you know through rev basically giving the idea the concept is to give customers greater value from choice over their energy use and facilitating the rapid expansion and integration of clean and distributed energy resources into the state's energy system and you know that's including investment from the private sector accelerating innovation and technology and engaging communities so essentially what we're trying to do here is foster and facilitate the ability for consumers to choose electrical services that are now technically available might not have been available uh, before and then we need to design a marketplace to help consumers to find those resources so essentially it's changing the role of the utility company to be a manager of the grid and you know the whole idea there is you know we've seen so many sectors advanced over the last 10 years not and even over the next hundred past hundred years really our electrical infrastructure has not advanced at the pace that all these other um, sectors have advanced at and there's technology that's available but we're just not using it so because we spend so much money upgrading our grid infrastructure we just want to do it now in a more efficient way by using distributed generation so REV has two tracks. There's track one, which is launching uh, policy directives, and then track two, which is going to start in the near future, which is really uh, starting the architecture, the build of the new rate designs here in New York State. And we also have ongoing REV demonstration projects that the utility companies are working on. That's a rolling program. Um, there's, I don't know how many there are now, maybe up to 10 or so, and uh, more can come online uh, to demonstrate uh, certain, um, you know, ways in which we could reach these REV goals and, and help uh, consumers. So hey, David, we're in New York... Quick. Can I ask you a real quick question? I want to get out of the panels, but can you quickly tell us a little bit about New York Sun? Because that's sure. the program you oversee, and it'd be great for people to know about it. Yeah, there's there's really New York Sun's a huge component of REV obviously because REV is really reliant on distributed generation Absolutely. and New York Sun is the the most robust solar program here in New York State so New York Sun is basically a one billion dollar initiative a lot of that money goes into incentives it's a declining megawatt block design program and uh, it offers transparency and certainty to the market and uh, we've had our market basically um, build over the last several years uh, once New York Sun um, started and it's been a very successful program up to this point and we hope it continues to, to be so in the future and the goal for New York Sun is to build three gigawatt three gigawatts by 2023 excellent okay let's keep going on then we're gonna come back uh, to interactive conversation among all the panelists so Eric uh, at the end of 2015 the solar industry obviously garnered a big win at the federal level with the extension of the ITC or the investment tax credit. What's your take on the impact of this extension on the solar industry in general? And more specifically, how will it impact solar deployment at the state and metro level and with the governments, and you talk a little bit about the corporates as well, that you work with, um, but as the governments increase their RPS and low carbon targets? So over to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, obviously the extension of the ITC was you know, really important for the solar industry in general. 
we talked a little bit about this before the call, but it's the it's kind of the predictability and regulatory certainty that's really key for the solar industry to continue to grow. And I think without it, had there not been an extension, you know, what we would have seen instead of continuing to ramp up is really contraction, especially in certain states where it's tighter to get fields of pencil. They would have shut down, and, and states even such as California and New York may have really slowed down on the adoption side. So, you know, what it means with the extension of the state metro levels that I think we'll continue to see the accelerated uh, deployment of solar, and hopefully these government entities have the opportunity to hit their goals probably earlier than they would have, or much earlier, had there not been the extension. Um, you know, th that said, I don't want to say, hey, we all let's all sit back in the glow of ICC extension. Sure. Uh, but but let's figure out how to use those tax dollars, tax dollars wisely, right? We're all taxpayers, and I'd rather see government agencies betting clean energy, uh, uh, using those savings, and using those savings to transportation, education. There's a lot of better ways to use money. Uh, you know, I mean, literally today we've got schools, cities, counties, by saving millions of dollars with PV and storage solutions they've deployed. So you know, with that, that ICC expense, it's really an opportunity for these government agencies to start to vet and how they can leverage uh, renewables and, and not only from an environmental perspective, uh, but to drive uh, cost savings and, and better leverage those taxpayer dollars. Great. Well, let's move on now to Scott and then we'll bring everyone into a broader conversation. Scott, in your role at the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, uh, you played an integral role in Vermont, in, in Washington, D.C., and elsewhere developing and managing programs to enable the deployment not just of renewables but energy efficiency and green buildings. Uh, from your vantage point and your experiences in Vermont, um, what do you see as some of the biggest actions that government officials and regulators can take to ensure the growth of, of regional low carbon economies? Ron, thanks for hosting this event. I'm glad to dive in here. You know, I'd like to start with a couple things we know that we certainly know that uh, our governments can act on. You know, it's important to recognize that we know that a, a high saturation renewable future is technically viable, and that comes to play in the dialogues that we just heard from the other panelists. You know, in Vermont, we have a 15% net meter cap on solar, uh, and we were at a couple percent a year ago, and we have many utilities that are already at and surpassing that that cap, and the grid's running just fine, thank you very much. We also have a community of 40,000 in Burlington, Vermont, that is now 100% renewable um, driven. So these things work, and they work because the economics work. Um, it's not more or less expensive than the status quo, and we know we get so many other benefits uh, to society. That really resonates with government um, uh, decision makers, policy makers. Uh, and w the key thing I always think of for government is to drive um, a three-legged stool. Um, we've got to get the policy right, and it has to be bold, and it has to have vision in it of where we want to go. Go. We've got to set the regulatory structure right so we can enable risk and action with things like performance contracting and decoupling and RPSs, um, but with the certainty that we were just hearing Eric speak of. Uh -huh. And then lastly, we've got to build markets and public-private um, partnerships uh, so that uh, all of that good regulatory and policy structure can enable um, and lastly, I, the last thing I would say is uh, uh, I'd offer a math problem for us all, which is how efficiency plays into all of this, which is um, we've got a denominator problem. The problem to solve with renewable energy is only as big as it is when we use more energy than we need to. And so if we lower the denominator, which is efficiency's job, we make the renewable energy goals much more attainable, we help with the economics of the projects, and we lower bills all of which helps. And then the last challenge of getting to 100% is just another math problem, which if we don't focus some of our attention on those with the least, the low-income populations, moderate income, and the small businesses, we can't ever get to 100%. So a couple math problems and then, uh, for government to take on and that broad three-legged stool. Those are the things I think that government can do to really enable our success. Uh, that's a great overview. And, and, and the tech policy capital frame is one that we've used at Clean Edge from 15 years ago, and just a shout out to Dan Riker for really forwarding that many years ago, and a really good uh, lesson for everyone on, on, on the call, and, and thanks for the math problems, so let's all work on those together. I, I'm going to just do a quick reminder to everyone, uh, we'll be moving over to questions from the audience uh, after I do some moderate Q&A with questions I've already prepared, uh, so please start typing in your questions into the chat box. Uh, on the GoToWebinar side panel, and, and Bryce will get those over to me. Um, 
So let's now move into this broader conversation. Uh, David Cal from California, I, I, I just, you know, you successfully forward this amazing 50% by 2035 RPS mandate, which is quite astounding for a large state. Um, but, but language to cut petroleum use by 50% over the next 15 years was stripped from the, the final bill after objections from the oil industry and some lawmakers. Can you give today's audience a quick overview of what happened there, lessons learned, and the road ahead for California in tackling the petroleum transportation portion of the energy equation? Sure. So just to recap, a year ago, Governor Brown in his state of the state uh, proposed three big energy goals, a 50% renewable energy uh, mandate by 2030, uh, increasing energy efficiency for existing buildings by 50% by 2030, and cutting oil use for transportation by 50% by 2030. So what happened is we tried to hit a grand slam and we ended up with a two-run triple. We got the efficiency and the renewables piece through. We did not get the oil piece through. However, um, I, I actually think the oil piece is going to happen anyway, but through other mechanisms. Uh, um, there is enormous momentum in electric vehicles. And by the way, one of the uh, features of the legislation that did get passed is a, a big uh, push uh, for utilities to build out the EV charging infrastructure. And we're seeing even uh, the news this week coming on the market in October, uh, Chevy is coming out with a electric vehicle in the $30,000 price range that will go uh, 200 miles on a charge, right? And uh, Tesla is going to do the same in 2017. Um, so big cost reduction, I think, with the electrification of the, of the vehicle fleet. So I'm actually very bullish on that third goal uh, getting done. That is a major... Uh, you know, objective for the governor. He's. Uh, we have right now a goal of a million and a half electric vehicles by 2025. And I was with him at a, a speech a few weeks ago, and he, you know, was calling for five million electric vehicles by by 2030. So uh, the number keeps increasing. I just would recap. You know, the the question of what is the ultimate end goal. You know, what what where, what is the end point that we end up? I mean, there's different views about that, even within my commission, even within the the family of. Uh, energy agencies, but my own view is that uh, where we need to go is what I'd call the electrification of almost everything and then green right. electricity to 100%. And I think that's the path we're on. And you're seeing now a lot of progress on, on even the electrification of homes that are being built without gas lines, uh, electrification of buses, um, you know, bicycles, motorcycles, and so forth. There's a, a big push for that uh, now in California. Great. And that really ties into the renewables piece of the whole equation. Um, Let's go to another question. Um, I want to go around uh, around the panelists, um, but I want to ask, what do each of you see as one of the next big wave of clean energy innovation? Uh, we talked a little bit about energy storage, uh, microgrids might be up there, but uh, David Sandbank, let's start with you. What, what sure. are you looking out at, and where do you see a lot of innovation happening in, in sort of the near to midterm over the next three to five years? You know, it's interesting. I see the innovation here in New York State having a, happening on the regulatory side. I think the next big wave here in New York State is a shared solar program that was passed. It's uh, called Community Distributed Generation. And I think what's going to happen now is I think we've got some of the, the one of the most flexible uh, shared solar programs in the country. And I think that's going to be the next wave here in New York State. Well, and thanks for explaining that innovation doesn't have to just be a tech innovation, but obviously these policy or regulatory or structural. But can you tell us just a little bit more about like what makes that innovative? I think some people on the call definitely know about community solar, others might not. Um, how does that actually sure. work? What are the mechanics? I mean, basically, community solar, as, as everyone, as a lot of people know, when you're trying yeah. to sell solar projects, here in New York State, I would say about 20% of homeowners can probably go solar just based on solar viability. So uh, what happens is project developers spend so much money on customer acquisition costs um, because they can only monetize 20% of their demographic. So, and on the ratepayer side, people who want to go solar and save money on their electric bill, uh, Obviously, only 20% of the market can do so. So now with shared solar, 
basically and if you are in the same utility uh, territory and the same NISO region um, and you build a one megawatt solar project you can divide that solar project up into pieces and sell it off to different customers within that territory so the solar project doesn't have to be on somebody's uh, on the end users uh, facility um, they can purchase the K KWH that comes off that and you could also either sell it to the members uh, of this uh, shared solar project or you can have a lease or a PPA agreement with them what makes this program very flexible is um, you're allowed to if you own this system or you're the manager of this system you can swap out your members on a month-by-month -month basis so it's a really great way to uh, allow distributed generation to reach the masses and inclusive of your low to moderate uh, income homeowners as well. Excellent. I, I see that as well as a, a major paradigm shift. Um, let's go now, Eric, then Scott, and then David H. So Eric, what, what are the big clean energy innovations you're, you're looking at? Yeah, if I focus more on the technology side, obviously storage is a huge, sure. huge component of the future. If you look at gigawatt factory coming on from Tesla and the, and the cost of batteries coming down, it's really going to become a standard part of PV solutions. So it's not going to be, hey, I'm doing storage, but really it's going to be an integrated product. Um, you know, already at the utility level, we're seeing co-ops such as KIUC using storage to do a full load shift. So instead of having massive production midday when everyone's coming home at 4 to 8, they can use storage to take that PV energy, load shift it, and use it really when they need it. So it eliminates all intermittent nature of PV and allows them to use that power when they need, which which is really critical. Um, kind of at the customer level, what we're seeing, we're doing a lot of these projects in California with public sector schools, is a combination of that competitive power from a PPA perspective and then storage doing peak load reduction. So really shaving that peak load that they pay for uh, within their uh, energy costs. So you know, I think what, what we're seeing is public sector customers have to get used to looking at proposals that really are offering the greatest savings, which isn't necessarily the cheapest PPA rate. Uh, really, when you look at kind of combining PV and storage, um, it basically provides the equivalent PPA rate that's, you know, call it one to two cents below a standard PV solution. So, you know, instead of this traditional race to the bottom, when you integrate PV and storage, I think what the public sector needs to look at sort of evaluate is, it's really the race to the top. What is my highest guaranteed savings that both these products combined offer? Great. Um, Scott, let's go over to you. What, what, what are the big innovations that you see in the next three to five years on the clean energy front? Yeah, I come at this thinking that uh, technology is going to continuously evolve and change, and so I, I came at it a little bit different with that assumption in place. Uh, for me, the way the thing that's going to change the most is our need to integrate and make things simple. Um, you know, in Vermont, our goal, our, our, our broader goal is actually to get the 90% of all all energy use to be renewable by 2050. And you can't do that with silos. We've got currently a, a electric efficiency silo, thermal energy, transportation efficiency, um, renewable energy at different scales, and then storage. And consumers don't want to be energy geeks. So we need to figure out all of these systems are crying for integration. Um, and we've got to really bring what I think of as complexity to the market which is uh, this is really complicated stuff with a, with a populace and business community that wants easy. So we have to be the, 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 the real innovation has got to be around uh, having all of us play Wizard of Oz behind the curtain and deal with all the complex while what comes to consumers and businesses is endlessly simple to engage with. And to me, that's where the innovation and next wave has to come for us to meet these sort of goals. Excellent. So the the, the kiss uh, concept, um, David Hochschild, uh, what do you what do you see on this? Uh, yeah, I would say front. there's sort of technology innovation, and then what I'd call more barrier busting uh, innovation, and and by that I mean things like reforming how permitting is done. Like we found it was actually costing about two thousand five hundred dollars when you added up all the costs to permit a residential um, solar project in California and they did a, a bill to do fast track over the counter you know uh, one day permitting and things like procurement innovation um, 
and set up all these cities bidding separately, and they got 15% savings just through economies of scale. Uh, so this has nothing to do with technology. It's just how you how you approach it. And then on the technology side, I agree with what um, Eric said earlier. Storage, I think, is the next great frontier. And if we can do for storage costs what we've done for solar, uh, I am very bullish about our ability to, to get off fossil fuels even faster. And, you know, I would, I would note this factory that Tesla is building, the storage, this battery factory in Nevada, is the second largest building in the world, right? That, and that's, you know, getting to scale like that is a big piece of it. But um, we have a lot more work to do in terms of making it easy for people to, to deploy storage uh, here in the state. So I, I want to move now to sort of the grid of the future. As I mentioned, we have this grid modernization index coming out next week. Um, Scott, you, you work with utilities across the nation, and one of your organizations, uh, DC Sustainable Energy Utility, even uses the term in its name. Um, David Sandbank, you mentioned how uh, you're really asking uh, – for the utilities to reconsider their role and sort of set the regulatory structures for that. So just for anyone who wants to respond to this, what does the utility of the future look like? And, and you know, we haven't seen great innovation on the utility front, but what are things looking like five to ten years from now? Um, Scott, why don't we start with you real quick? Sure. I, I see a real potpourri coming on what is the utility of the future. I see three distinct pathways that um, are in front of us. Uh, and the first of that is that we're asking our electric utilities to undergo really radical transformation to move from uh, their historic kind of purveyors of the grid and, and all things that lead to flipping a switch to these really customer-facing organizations that um, provide a whole array of services. It's really an interesting model, um, and it's, it, it's a great question in my mind how many utilities will make that transition because it is such a difference. Um, you know, here in Vermont, we're trying that with something called Act 56, where we've actually required our utilities to not only start providing services on electric, but also to do that on the thermal side, even when there's no electric um, involvement. Uh, so we'll see how well uh, th this model will move. I think it's the leading model in terms of public discourse of having utilities reform themselves. I think just as easily the utilities could stay focused on making an ever more complex and dangerous from a cybersecurity grid, keep that stable and for all people, and uh, have things like the District of Columbia Sustainable Energy Utility become that, uh, that uh, public-facing, uh, service-oriented, market-enabling utility. They could be peer, or, peer utilities owned by the same company or they could be separate. And then the third path, I think, is uh, I think we are going to see failure of utilities in different ways. Uh, I think straight up, some just aren't going to make the transition because they don't want to, and uh, the world is going to really create a lot of trouble for them. And second, I think it's why we see a lot of mergers and acquisitions is um, we're just going to see a lot fewer utilities as part of the utility of the future. Uh, right now, I think the first one I talked about is where most people think the future is, and, and frankly, I think it's a future uh, whose, uh, whose tale has not been told yet. Great. David Sandbake, are we going to see a future where the utilities are managing the grid and others are providing the electrons? What, what do you see in the next five to ten years? Yeah, I mean, that's a good one. Um, I agree with a lot of what Scott just said. Um, it's a major transition to try to, you know, have companies whose main goal is to keep the power on um, and rate base, you know, electrical upgrades to become a uh, open marketplace where they're on the distribution side and allowing third-party markets to come involved. Um, right now, in my opinion, I think that the utility companies um, certainly have a, a good opportunity to be able to be early adopters in the marketplace. I think that if they um, don't become early adopters, I think what might happen is um, there will be other market drivers that steal market share from them. Um, and, you know, it's a very important role that the utility companies have today. And I, th I really think that those utility companies that see the vision um, will be able to prevail, uh, much like what Scott said. And right, also... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. 
No, no, please. Um, I was just going to say on the on the solar side, I'm a big believer that the utility companies have to have skin in the game uh, when a solar project is built, and that solar projects can't just be revenue loss for the utility companies. Otherwise, it's just going to be business as usual, and it's going to be very difficult to move a solar market. So I think that you know there certainly has to be a model in place in the future where the utility companies are benefiting from uh, distribution generation as as well as as the rest of the state great um eric um solar city has played a, a, a critical role as a, a you know in the disruption side of the equation you're also working with utilities what are things looking like three five ten years from now uh, on the utility landscape yeah I, I think kind of scott and david nailed as far as there's gonna be a certain group that wants to move forward as things progress and certain folks are going to dig their heels in i yeah. think for the utilities they're looking at how do we how do we work in this new environment of PG and, and PV being deployed? You start to look at, you know, at least from a technology point of view, more storage being deployed. You're going to start to probably see storage in front of the meter. So now from a utility perspective, there's ways for us to partner with them, give them access to these assets. So now they can do what basically KIUC is doing, right? They can start using those storage assets to use some of that power in the grid when they need it. Those DG projects are going to be spread out across their grid. Uh, so it'll help in a lot of their congested areas. So, you know, I think as some of the technology evolves, I think as more storage is deployed with TV, it becomes closer to a partnership model than some of the, the battles that are out there today. David Hochschild, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, well, just it is worth noting that there's been enormous innovation in renewable energy energy technology and virtually no innovation in utility business models. And there is a real cautionary tale uh, from Germany, right, where you had the largest utilities in Germany, RWE and E.ON, fail to invest in, in renewables uh, mm. in the mid-2000s. And, you know, what happened? They lost 80% uh, of their, their market cap. Um, and had they invested in renewables, actually, they would have increased um, their market cap substantially. So I think there's a cautionary tale there. I, I actually feel a big part of the future of the utilities is going to be around the electrification of the vehicle fleet. And if they're smart, really getting ahead of the curve on that and um, taking advantage of the, the cost reduction that's happening um, now with, with batteries and electric vehicles. And, and that can be a new uh, source of revenue for them. Excellent. Uh, we have a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, please keep those uh, coming in and, and we'll get to them. And after uh, I just got two more questions, I'm going to write in all the questions you guys are sending over. Um, so d just to everyone real quick, I mean, uh, Clean Edge and Solar City have, have polled homeowners two years in a row. Uh, one key takeaway is that consumers overwhelmingly want choice when it comes to their energy supply. And, and maybe not surprisingly, but, but importantly, uh, they favor renewables considerably over coal, nuclear, and even natural gas. Just wondering for those government reps on the call with us today, how much of the shift that we are seeing is being driven by consumers? Uh, David Hochschild? Oh, I mean, that's the, the beauty of uh, distributed renewables right now is that the ability to turn the faucets on and off does not rest with the utility. Customers can, can do this. By so just as an example, we have now a half a million rooftop solar energy systems in California and uh, growing like gangbusters, and that's all driven by customers. And if, if you look at how the market works, there is a kind of contagion effect where a lot of people decide to go solar because they see their neighbor uh, installing it and so forth. So that's one of the exciting things about uh, where we're at now. It, it can be driven by, by consumers. Scott, how much are you seeing it? this is being driven? Obviously, there's lots of stakeholders, but how much you look at the consumer, the end consumer, when you're making all these different plans? Oh, it's just huge. That's really what's driving the market. It's why we've already blown by the 15% net meter cap here in Vermont. Um, what I would say, though, and this is a really important piece for folks uh, listening here, is uh, I don't really buy that this is an environmental tidal wave sweeping the country to deal with climate change and other environmental considerations. I, th I do think the populace cares about that. Every analysis I see is it's still not why people pull the lever when they vote or punch the chat or however they do it. This still comes down to economics. If, if, if it isn't a good economic choice and it's not simple, um, the, the public opinions won't turn into deals. The reason they are in the places where who are seeing the most adoption of solar and efficiency and every other transition 
are where the prices, the economics have gotten right and it's been made relatively simple. So I think we can't lose our uh, having our eyes on on those critical aspects. It won't just happen at a higher price than uh, than the rest of the market. Great, uh, David Sambank. Yeah, um, very interesting topic. Of course, consumers drive the market, but when consumers don't have a choice to go solar or don't have the political will or the regulatory environment to go solar, what good is their voice? So I would say at the top is the political will and regulatory environment, and then after that, it's the consumers um, in that order. Great. Eric, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, those are great points from both Scott and David. I'm totally aligned with that. Um, you know, the way I see it is it's obviously depending on the state and, and solar supported there, but consumers and taxpayers always want a choice when it comes to their energy. But they also want companies they're buying from to use clean energy. It becomes part of their brand. And from a taxpayer perspective, you know, we also want to see governments using clean power where it makes economic sense. And that's what Scott touched on, which I think is absolutely true. Out of the thousands of projects we've done, there's been maybe one where someone paid more for clean power. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so it's more than just the environmental perspective, which obviously I think is critically important, but it's really from a taxpayer perspective, what's the optimal use of taxpayer money? Why should schools or cities pay more for energy when they have a choice, especially in certain states? So, you know, consumers have had a choice on where they buy and how to vote. The difference now, I think, is what drives these decisions. Now, we're starting to see that shift in how consumers make buying and voting decisions based, based on how companies and local governments are uh, adopting the use of renewables. And, and going back to Scott's point, obviously, is where it makes economic sense. So we're going to be driving cost savings and, uh, and, and leveraging that when, when possible. Yeah, and, and just for everyone on the call, the, the homeowner survey that we've done two years in a row, it was very clear uh, cost savings trump everything else. So that absolutely yep, resonates. Yep. I, we're we're going to move over now to, to questions for the audience because they're, they're just coming in fast and furious. Um, and, and I'll do my best to sort of moderate these. Um, so, so the first question is around the Internet of Things, and it's also really more of a security issue. So we asked, how will the Internet of Things help support gaining 100% renewable energy? And, and I think this is the, the key part of the question. What are the potential security risks and other concerns in relation to IoT and renewable energy that states and local players need to take seriously? Uh, I'll throw it out there, and whoever wants to jump in first. Or I will call on someone. Uh, <laughs> David Sandbank, let's go with you first. Yeah, I was hoping you wouldn't call on me. Um, <laughs> I would say I am probably not the best panelist to answer that question. I would just be uh, making it up as a pretended I knew it, and I, I just okay. don't, I'm not the expert in that area. And anyone want to talk about security and how that does play in? Maybe David. Well, I, I would Oakshield. just say so. The model is going to change in the sense of uh, you know. Traditionally, the way it's worked in the power industry is that uh, electric generation follows electric demand. You have factory turns on, you turn on power plants to provide the energy. And now, as we move to uh, toward an increasingly renewable world, to some extent, that's going to flip, and some load is actually going to be designed to follow renewable generation. When you charge your electric vehicle or electric bus, or pre-cooling buildings, or even when the defrost cycle on your refrigerator, which runs once a day, you don't care when that is. We need to design these things to match renewable generation, and there will be this increasing dispatchability. And you know that is also going to be vulnerable with appliances to um, some level of hacking. But that's also the case, you know, today with uh, everything from online banking yeah, across to across the board. Else. Yeah. So. You know, we just need to be mindful of it and and recognize, you know, um, there's new new challenges associated. I don't think it's unmanageable, but I do think it it needs you know careful attention. Um, Eric Scott, either of you want to comment on security and yeah. how that factors in? Sure. I mean, I, ironically enough, I think it's almost the opposite. When you have, you know, if you think about having just a couple massive power plants across the U.S., if you knock down one of those, it has a massive impact on your grid. As you start to spread out DG uh, and leverage technologies, you've got generation all over the grid. Um, right. You know, I think the only the only potential area, and I don't think we're there yet. If you look at renewables, they're fairly dumb assets, right? You've got PV on a rooftop, storage. I think the future is the software and the intelligence and the algorithms that sit across all of those assets, 
to optimize and, and in that integration with the grid. So I, I would assume, you know, in the future is so much of it can be driven by application software that might be a risk point, but you know, I think those are all addressed within a secure data center and things that are done with technology companies today, so I'm not overly concerned there. I think Great. Eric hit the hit the hit the security thing well. I just it's a worth a moment just to chat about the Internet of Things and the wonderful opportunity that gives you know a couple of good examples uh, to have uh, uh, folks kind of begin to wonder about the the endless possibility is you is the idea that you know the Tesla is a web enabled car that as it's plugged in um, can be disconnected for for a demand response purpose. And then the owner of that car can get paid, right? Um, so now it's really part of the grid. What a wonderful new opportunity, and everything will be like that. And you know, on the efficiency side with the Internet of Things, um, we with programmable thermostats, particularly web-enabled ones, you can now um, use those for different purposes. You can pull that data. You can uh, get some publicly available information about a building. You can basically run regression curves, and you can know how tight the building is without ever knocking on the door. Um, and so th that will so enable uh, the, the more efficiency in, uh, to occur and therefore those dollars to be able to plow into re renewable systems and other improvements. So um, while there, there are, of course, some security risks with all of that, uh, the opportunity opens up to really meet these goals is endless and, and is as wide as our imaginations can lead us. Great. Um, Scott, I'm going to stick with you for one more moment because these questions are coming in, as I said, and this is one on advanced wood heating and, and biomass, biofuels. Um, so the quick question is, is how does uh, advanced wood heating fit into Vermont's clean energy vision? Um, and then for the panel, does renewable biofuels biomass play a significant role in meeting significant RE goals? So Scott, let's start with you real quick. Yeah, modern wood heat is really an amazing uh, innovation that is uh, with us now and I think is important for our future. Uh, these systems, uh, these new, these new uh, technology systems uh, meet and beat the emission profile of uh, natural gas boilers um, and, and are using a renewable resource that frankly can enable more sequestration to occur. Uh, we have more than a third of all of our public schools running on on wood pellet uh, modern wood heat systems now here in Vermont wow. and more more of the population uh, of those students than that so we see it as a real big piece for rural America that has biomass uh, uh, and, and wood available to them uh, is a really integral piece of moving off fossils and getting to a renewable platform uh, and then David and David uh, both on the electricity side of the equation and the, the heat and power side or the heat side um, where does biofuels and biomass play in? Uh, David Hoke Shield first. Well, for us, it's a major part of the um, solution to the problem of, of forest fires. We have a lot of, uh, you know, we had really the worst forest fires um, that I can remember in our state's history the last few years. And, you know, biomass um, is a way to, to reduce that fuel load. Uh, it is more expensive than, than wind and solar. What you've seen the last few years, uh, if you look at the renewables in our portfolio, Wind and solar have really separated from the pack, and so biomass as well as geothermal are, are almost twice the cost. So they're they're, uh, but you know you can make an argument, um, which I subscribe to, that they also provide uh, you know a significant uh, additional benefit of reducing forest fires. So that's I think there's a strong push in the state to try and sustain that uh, market for that reason. Right, and David Sandbank, uh, how does this play into New York's plans? Well, New York's plans, yeah, it it does. We've basically we now have a new program called Renewable Heat, and those I think it's like three port, three technologies. It's um, you know wood burning stoves, pellet stoves, and um, solar thermal, and then geo and air source heat pumps, and that really is a program that's going to be launched in the very near future, uh, in a strategic way. And basically, Governor Cuomo's come out with a mandate or a state energy plan, you know, which includes by 2030, 40% reduction in greenhouse gas uh, emission uh, reductions. Um, so, and also to have 50% of our electricity demand being met with um, renewable energy. So, and 600 TBTUs of consumption reduction through energy efficiency. So there's clearly a holistic approach here in New York State. 
And I think that, you know, in order to reach that 40% reduction, um, that's a lot of it's going to be run through our renewable heat program. Great. Um, so another question, uh, as it's to all the panelists, uh, it says, I know this session is about states and local governments moving to high RE objectives forward, but tonight is President Obama's final State of the Union address. What would you like to hear from him about advancing the clean energy economy? I I'd like to change it up just a little bit. Um, you know, I, I actually think Obama has been a champion in many ways. Uh, he got done what he could get done. I'd like to ask each of you, what should the next president be considering, and, and what would we do at the national level to really, uh, you know, lay the groundwork for states and, and cities to, to, to move the needle forward as they're already trying to do? Eric, why don't we start with you with that question, and we'll go around. Yes, yeah, interesting. And I think you see some of the challenges when you're dealing with Fortune 500 that have locations across the U.S. When, you, when you're looking at local markets, you yeah. work within that market with the government. So I think any support from a Fed on trying to, and I don't know if they'd want to tell states how to, how to run their business, but supporting a, a program that goes across straight lines. I mean, every single customer we have down to a state level has probably three or four different utilities across that state to work with. They have different programs. You know, you might have ZREC in Connecticut, SREC in a lot of Northeast states. You got Bluff programs in New York. You have CSI in California. So you have all these different programs, which are fantastic. But it does make it a little bit more challenging. We're working with national customers, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, to figure out a standardized solution. So, you know, I don't know how they would create it, but supporting some sort of infrastructure um, that would enable us to have kind of a consistent program look and feel across the U.S. would obviously enable kind of large-scale uh, growth multi-state with, with those Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies. Great. Anyone else want to tackle what uh, either Obama could talk about tonight, or I would say even more importantly, what maybe the next president could forward if they were a champion of clean energy? Uh, Scott Johnstone? Sure. Um, I think this one's really simple. I think the uh, the way that we make the most progress uh, across this nation and on, on this agenda is to have a price on carbon, um, whether, whether it's a pure uh, carbon tax, uh, which Wall Street is already paying attention to, or whether it's a California model with a cap and trade on carbon. Um, you know, I'm open to both. I think the tax is a more uh, pure policy solution and, and, and would drive more results without as much uh, dollars involved. Um, but uh, either way would get us there. Uh, you know, when, when early in his presidency, when President Obama talked about this, um, Wall Street was, was telling utilities that they had to green up their portfolio um, if, if for no other reason than as a hedge against it potentially passing. Imagine if we actually had a national policy that set a price on carbon. This is David. Have Just it. to add to that, I, I, I fully agree with that. I think the other thing I would, I would point out, I do think it's time to end subsidies for fossil fuels. And if you look mm. at, at how we have Good subsidized point. renewables versus fossil fuels, there's three differences. The subsidies for fossil fuels are much more numerous. They've been around much longer, and they typically don't expire. So you have the oil depletion allowance, which started in 1926 and continues in perpetuity, right? And then the solar and wind tax credits, you know, expire every two, three years, and we have to, you know, fight to get them extended. And, and uh, you know, now they are going to end in 2020. Um, you know, this is the, the, the oil industry is the most profitable industry in the world. They don't need these kind of incentives. And I, I feel like uh, that's a very tough hill to climb politically, but ultimately that, that's got to happen as well. Yeah, this is David Sandbank. Um, amen. Uh, I totally agree with that. Um, I'm always dumbfounded that um, if you look at the um, people that are in the conversation right now, we represent a handful of states in the nation. And the biggest problem I always say is that if you look at a national solar company like, you know, Solar City, I mean, Eric, you've probably got about nine to 12 main states that you play in out of 50. And if we're going to move forward as a country to have a true energy strategy to not only modernize just California, New York's or Vermont's grid, but our, our whole grid as a whole, because of resiliency, because of efficiency, because of air quality, we've really got to have a national approach. And until we get to that point, you know, we're not going to really be able to affect 
um, the cost of solar to a with nine or f a handful of states here in the United States when there's other countries that are far surpassing us. Great. Um, and that, that's a, a, a very important point. Um, I, I want to move to another question. Uh, we're not going to get to all of them because they keep coming in, but this one just very quickly. I, I, we, we tend to be on the side of the, the energy storage, uh, lithium ion chemistry side of the equation versus fuel cells, but we've actually gotten two fuel cell questions. Um, how much for energy storage and or the transportation piece of the equation are your organizations looking at uh, fuel cells as a, you know, maybe, you know, you're probably not wanting to pick technologies, but how much do you see fuel cells uh, being part of that uh, moving forward? And obviously the Japanese are kind of pursuing a fuel cell uh, pathway. Uh, David Hochschild? Yeah, so we give about $100 million away a year for um, clean transportation, and hydrogen fuel cells are maybe $15 million of that. We We do have a portfolio approach in our funding uh, a number of different technologies. I think fuel cells have a future. I think for transportation, it's it's really going to be in like fleet vehicles where it really makes sense. The hydrogen fueling infrastructure um, is expensive and you have to build a separate pipeline network, right, to supply it. So that is one advantage electric vehicles have is the electric grid is already there and you simply have to plug in the vehicle. So uh, I think it's going to be more in, in, in fleets in terms of how it gets gets deployed. So, so more on transportation than stationary. Um, let's go around real quick because I want to get to another question. Anyone else have a comment on fuel cells and, and their role? Yeah, I, I think I think he nailed it as far as uh, more on the transportation side. We vetted certain technologies, combined heat and power, uh, and it comes back to what Scott had mentioned earlier of economics, right? They have to be viable right now. What we're seeing is PV and, and uh, uh, battery storage. So uh, obviously if the economics work, we would we, we bet those, but um, probably more uh, deployment on the transportation side. Okay, great. Um, another question around resiliency. Obviously it's been a big driver in the Northeast after Sandy. Uh, the question here is on the resiliency front, and maybe this is just quickly to you, David, and, and to Eric, um, how could you empower individual consumers to be part of the resiliency equation and where they could own and have on-site assets that, you know, would keep them up as the storm uh, might approach, et cetera? David, could you quickly talk about is are you looking down to the consumer level all the way when you look at your resiliency efforts? Sure. Which, David? Uh, David Sambank, sorry. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Well, you know, it's interesting on the storage end. Um, we have a rev demonstration project that's happening in New York City, and the battery storage is not owned by the consumer. The battery storage is owned by the utility company, but mm. the consumer is allowed to um, partake, you know, in the benefits of the battery. So that's how we have to think outside the box here, right? We have to figure out how this model can work. And the idea of uh, implementing all of the distributed generation, let's say, uh, solar within New York Sun allows for those types of add-ons and retrofits for future, um, you know, future uh, issues or solutions, um, or just new solar projects with battery integration. So um, definitely looking at it, I think from the commercial perspective, um, it's really the batteries, the battery play is very important, not so much on the resiliency side, but more on the demand management side mm -hmm. um, to offset, you know, more of that integrated approach. But then there's the resiliency side again, yeah, Superstorm Sandy is a huge political hot button and certainly that needs to be addressed, especially in the New York City area. Eric, why don't we wrap up with you? How much is resiliency right now playing into some of the commercial developments you're doing and even perhaps down to the residential level? Yeah, I think right now it's primarily focused on the commercial side, on peak load shaving. Um, I think that will evolve over time. Obviously, you have to have a partnership with the utility. As we, as, you know, if their grid goes down, you can't have a bunch of live inverters out there. As they're bringing things back up, but there way, there's probably going to be ways from a, a um, technology perspective to work with them so you can have local houses or facilities up and running using those uh, storage devices. So I think we're going to see, you know, residential, we're probably closer to that today where they can leverage uh, their storage assets to stay up, uh, but it has to be in conjunction with the grid and how the grid is going to bring themselves back up 
in that kind of failure environment. Right. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I know we could keep going on. Uh, as we stated and was made very clear, uh, states and cities and, and local governments are the laboratories of innovation and where the rubber meets the road. So thank you all for joining us, David Hochschild, David Sambank, Eric Fogelberg, and Scott Johnstone. It's been great to have both your time and your invaluable insights. I'd also like to thank our partner, Solar City, for making today's webinar possible. And as noted earlier, please note that this webinar has been recorded and our plan is to post a link on our website later today or tomorrow. Uh, thank you all again and have a great day. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks all. Bye-bye.